Our first reading this morning is from Paul's letter to the Philippians, and here Paul concludes the main portion of his letter with a final call to rejoice. This is Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. May God add blessing to the reading and the understanding of this scripture. Our gospel reading from the gospel according to Matthew is the closing words of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. This is Matthew 7, verses 24 through 29. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Now when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as their scribes. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This is our home, isn't it? 11485 South Ridgeview Road. It's been my church home for the last 17, now going on 18 years. But it hasn't felt as much like that since March 11th, but who's keeping track of the date when everything shut down? We did that first service, that first recording live stream from here uh, that Sunday morning, and it was so so weird and then and then we found out that we just needed to shelter at home and so we started doing those recordings from our separate houses and so um, Rick was using his piano at home and and a camera that um, Chandler helped him set up and microphone and and he was doing the music from there and and then you would uh, it would flip to uh, uh, Sean or Cheryl uh, doing the prayers and doing the scriptures from their specific homes and and then it would flip to either um, Kyle or I uh, doing the sermons with our cameras Kyle had a camera a, a, a phone camera as well as a regular camera I I just had my phone because I couldn't handle more than one thing and they set me up with a microphone and a cord and and, and a tripod and, and some box light things that are supposed to make you look better. And we all know that doesn't work out so well. And, and Pastor Michael was doing a Wednesday night devotion from his house. And it, it felt like we were strangers in a strange land, as the psalmist might say. And we did our best. And, and, and I was sure the whole time that we would be back in here by Easter. I was sure the whole time. I, I don't know if I thought back then that there would be a vaccine by Easter. I don't know if I thought that it would run its course. I don't know what I thought. But I just knew we would be back in here by Easter. The first, I believe it was the first or second weekend of April. That, that Carmen and Lydia would set up all the extra chairs that we always set up for Easter and, and Palm Sunday. And, and that we'd have all those challenging trumpeter lilies with their aroma <laughs> that I both hate and love at the same time. And that people would be coming in and, and you know what we would do, we would, we would stand up together and the first hymn always has to be, even though Rick and Brian and Keith and I always pretend that we're having a discussion about how we're going to start Easter Sunday with what hymn we will, we, we pretend to have this long drawn out discussion that we could change uh, the, the first hymn and sing something different. But you know what it has to be. Christ the Lord has risen today. And, 
And what we were told and what we saw across the country with those who continued to try to worship was that, was that singing, singing was a super spreader in too many places. So that had we gathered in this place on Easter and had we stood shoulder to shoulder and had we sung together, the, the last thing we would have experienced was the promise of life, which is what Easter is about. I'd been recording from different places in my home. Some of you remember that. And, and, and I'd gone out by a lake. Some of you remember that. And, and I decided on Holy Week that I wanted to be outside, that, that it would be a perfect time to be outside. And, and so my words for Good Friday, I did out in our outside worship area. And it was a marvelous idea in theory. In, in reality, as, as I was finishing up one of the words and, and I sat down on the bench out there, all of a sudden, somewhere in the neighborhood, I heard honk, 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 honk. And somebody's car alarm was going off. And I, I remember saying <laughs> into the tripod with the camera, really, really, 2020 isn't hard enough. This place is our home. You know, for 17 years and so many months, that was tied for me inextricably to the building, our home, to this building at 11485 South Ridgeview Road. I decided during Holy Week that for the first time I wanted to preach from here for Easter Sunday, for the recording. There still weren't anybody allowed to be in here but me. And so I, I brought my phone, my iPhone, and the tripod, and the, the microphone, and, and I stretched the, the cord that went to the microphone as far as I could. And Chandler already had a box set up that was left over from when we recorded live stream here that last Sunday. And, and I set that tripod on the box and... And I put a chair there to step up and down on the box to, to try to get my camera focused. And I wanted you to be able to see the chancel area because you hadn't been able to be in here. And, and, I, and I wanted to feel like I was with you and, and you were with me and, and we were experiencing the good news of, of Christ's resurrection here in this place we call home. And, and, and it was a blessing, but it was not the same. And you probably right now are saying to yourself, um, duh, And it, and it hit me like a ton of bricks. That this is only part of our home. But it's not the heart of our home. You. And me and everyone together. Are our heart. That is our home. We've walked with Paul through this month in his letter to the church at Philippi and we've heard every week either from Pastor Kyle last week as he preached or from Pastor Cheryl or from Sean, whoever's been reading the scriptures and, and, and as we've done those introductions, a reminder that Paul is sitting in prison and he does not believe he's likely to get out of it alive. He's been preaching the good news, you see, and, and it's upset the Roman Empire and it's upset the, the powers that be in the religious system of the day and and so he's, because of, because of religious tensions and political divides, he's incarcerated unjustifiably. And I have marveled again anew in this particular time as I have poured over and over and over these words from Paul to the church at Philippi, his spirit sitting in that prison awaiting what he believes is his own death. And as, as Pastor Kyle preached so relevantly last Sunday, that he says at one point, I will rejoice in my death or I will rejoice in my continuing to live with you. But all of it will be about my joy that I have in you. And it suddenly hit me that that's the heart of Paul's home too. In the midst of his struggle, in the midst of his storm, the, the, the community of faith at Philippi are his home. And he's writing a letter home. 
to bring home to him. And, and as he starts this, this last chapter, and I would tell you the most poignant and vulnerable and deep emotion and empathy of words in maybe all the scriptures, at least from Paul. He says, therefore, my brothers and sisters, how I long and love you, my joy and my crown. Stand firm in the Lord in this way. That's how he starts the fourth chapter, the final part of his letter. My brothers and sisters, my beloved, how I long and love you, long for and love you. My joy and my crown stand firm in the Lord in this way. That love is authentic. That love is vulnerable. It is, it is real in a way that sometimes we don't always give Paul credit. By the way, he then goes on in this very <laughs> significant chapter. He goes on to tell them to support two women who he says have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel. Um, Pastor Cheryl and I most particularly might take strength from those words when others will quote to us when they don't think it's legitimate that we preach or are ordained and they call on Paul's words that say women should not teach most particularly men and should not speak in the church in this particular most poignant letter to this community of faith in Philippi that Paul has helped to found. He says... Pray for and work with these two women who have struggled diligently alongside me for the sake of the gospel. And then he says what Sean read this morning. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Do not worry about anything. The Lord is near. Let your gentleness be seen by all. Let your gentleness. He's sitting in prison unjustifiably and the witness he wants them to make is a witness of rejoicing and gentleness and lack of worry. That's what he says. He says, stand firm in the Lord this way, in that first verse, in those first few verses. And then when we think, well, what way is he talking about? He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness, gentleness be known by all. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving to God, Make your requests known to God. And the peace that passes all understanding will rest your minds and hearts in Christ Jesus. So let's see. This is how you stand firm in the Lord. You let your gentleness be known. You don't worry about anything. You pray with thanksgiving and what will come to you is not victory what will come to you is not proof that you're right what will come to you is not even that this that this trumped up prison sentence that I'm serving will be overturned what will come to you Paul says is peace He's not promising wealth. He's not even promising fairness. He's telling them what he's experiencing in his heart for them and with them is peace. I'll confess to you that I have found out in the last seven months that I can be more whiny than I ever knew before. 
I can, I can be really whiny about, I got out of my car one more time and forgot my mask. So one more time, I'm walking back to my car and one more time, I'm getting out my mask. I can be whiny that there are clearly no right answers and no one will give them to me. No bishops, no district superintendents, no other senior pastors, no staff parishes, no administrative boards, no trustees. Oh, everybody has answers, but I want you see the one single right perfect answer about whether we should worship in person, about whether we should have classes back in the building, about all kinds of things. And I can be whiny about that. I think maybe you're not as surprised as maybe I was. There are storms raging around us. You know how Jesus decides to end his first and most full sermon recorded in the Gospels? This one we know as Sermon on the Mount. You know how Jesus chooses to end it? See, he could have ended it by talking about God coming again in victory. He could have ended it by saying, please understand, I have power over death itself. He could have ended it by saying, you know, things are going to get really bad, but then they're going to get great. He ends it by talking about houses and where they're built and the storms that come. That's how Jesus chooses to conclude a sermon. Those who hear my words and act on them. Meaning the words of the Sermon on the Mount that started with those Beatitudes in the fifth chapter. Those who hear my words and act on them are like the one who builds their house on the rock. And the rains fall and the floods rise and the winds come and beat on that house. But it does not fall because it is built on the rock. Those who hear my words in the Sermon on the Mount, that begins with the Beatitudes, and don't act on them, uh, blessed are the hung the hungry in spirit. Blessed are the those who mourn. <laughs> Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Those words, that's how the sermon starts. Those who are the light of the world, those who are the salt of the earth. Those who take care when they, when they pray and when they fast and when they give alms. Those who take a step back when they're about to judge someone and decide that they can take the log out of someone else's or take the speck out of someone else's eye before they take the log out of their own. Who are invited to not judge others in ways that we don't want to be judged. Those those who are invited to love their enemies, even when being persecuted. Those words. Those who hear those words, Jesus says, as he ends this sermon, and don't act on them, are like the person who builds their house on the sand. And the storms come, and the rains fall, and the floods rise, and the winds begin to beat on the house. And the house falls because it's built on the sand. And Jesus says, for added emphasis, great is its fall. And it says then that the people are astounded at Jesus' teaching. Because he teaches with authority. The, the words have taken on new meaning for me. During the storm that we are living through right now. The words have taken on new meaning that Sean read this morning. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. So I'm going to ask you as, 
as I come close to ending this sermon, I'm going to ask you to rejoice with me. Rejoice with me that we broke ground at the Center of Grace two weeks ago. Rejoice with me that we were still $1.4 million away of reaching the matching grant with the Maybe Foundation uh, 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 as the pandemic hit. And as Wayne Sims, who is the who's the president of the board, the chairperson of the board at the Center of Grace, as he was told by the Maybe Foundation, no one is raising sort of great amounts of money in these days, and, and me of little faith. I began wondering if we could extend that deadline with the, with the Maybe Foundation. I, I began to wonder how we, could, uh, how we could begin to look at other places about uh, where, how, uh, a way we could raise that kind of money, and then... And then one of the corporate foundations gave us a, another grant on top of the grant they'd already given us. And a private family foundation gave us a grant. And then, and then some of you took a little bit of a challenge from your senior pastor in the last days. And, and we met that goal. And I've been told that I, I don't tell our story enough. And, and at the groundbreaking, I had invited the district superintendent kind of at the last minute. And she sat there beside me and she said, uh, Nanette, um, why didn't you let the conference know this was happening so that I could have sent out the communications director? This is good news in the midst of this weird pandemic. And I was honest and said I didn't really think about it because we do what we do at Grace. But friends, please understand how much joy it brings that what we put a priority on first, as Kyle invited us last week to look first to the kingdom of God and then everything else will be added to us as well. That's what we did. That's what you did. That's what we as a community in Olathe did. Do you know that we are one of the few singular local churches that has partnered with corporate America to expand and renovate a building for direct mission service. And, and Pastor Sylvia is about the day-to-day -day operations of that place and she is marvelous at that. But, but allow me to be who I am. I, I take, right, I take this big, broad, expansive view and I say, you know what this witnesses to this community? Do you know what this witnesses to the people who are served there? That they don't simply deserve what's left over from what we have. What they will walk into when this project is done is new and renovated with plumbing that works and electricity that will handle all the computers. With safe access. And with enough room to double the number of children. For whom education will intervene in a cycle of poverty. And give them an opportunity in a longitudinal way to reach to reach a potential that perhaps some of them never would have dreamed before. This moves far beyond our generation, friends. And Dr. Luchin had that dream, and Pastor Sylvia had that dream, and you all had that dream. And I rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. We broke ground during, during a virus. And no one said, I don't want to break ground because some of the kids we serve here have different amounts of melanin in their skin. And there are protests going on all over the country. And so I refuse to be a part of this. No one, no one said that. I rejoice with you in our children and youth ministry staff who scrambled and within the first week to 10 days were putting out ways for our children to feel supported and heard and known. And our youth director, who, who all of a sudden realized we can't, we can't take mission trips, not only out of the country, we can't take mission trips out of this state. And all of a sudden, we were doing mission in the city in a safe way. I rejoice with you because you made that possible. And their lives continue to be supported. I rejoice with you that the confirmation class hung in there. And that as their, the end of their wasn't happening the way they wanted to. The end of their confirmation season wasn't happening the way they wanted to either. And they stayed. And parents supported their staying. 
I rejoice with you that we have the musicians we have in this church. I miss the celebration choir. I know you do too. I miss the instruments of grace. I know you do too. I miss the bells. I know you do too. And I rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I rejoice for the quality of music that we have in our volunteers and our paid musicians who have not once said to me, Nanette, stop calling and asking me to continue to do this. Not once have they said, I'll come and do it if I don't have to wear my mask inside. I'm a whiner, they're not. I rejoice with you always. Again, I say rejoice. I rejoice with you, and this is going to sound odd. I rejoice with you for Pastor Michael, who in the midst of this pandemic moved to a brand new community. And friends, he is doing amazing gospel work in that place. And there, there would not be a harder time to take a new appointment. And Esther's selling out her baked goods <laughs> at their farmer's market. And Paul's come out of his shell a bit. I rejoice with you because you sent them forth with blessing. I rejoice with you for letting us preach on the roof. I rejoice with you for letting us preach in the outdoor worship area. I rejoice with you for, for being willing to pre-register the last couple of weeks to come inside in a safe way. I, I rejoice with you that I know you're willing, even in frustration, to go with us if we have to stop that part of our worship again. I rejoice with you that our online presence is bigger than it's ever been. And you know how hard it is for me to say that I rejoice with you in that. And I rejoice that you haven't pulled back to protect what you have. That's what would have been predictable for every congregation. To, to pull back before, to, to say I'm not, I'm, I, I can't risk anything that I have anymore until I find out when this is going to end and, and, and how it's going to work out and, and if this is ever even going to be a thing again. Because everything I just listed, and it's not even been half of what is happening, you all have made possible. Thank you. And this place still isn't home. Because it's just a place. You are home. You and, and us together are this particular home of God's blessing. And perhaps my most favorite words, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, then keep on thinking and doing the things that you have heard and seen in me, Paul says. And the God of all creation will be with you. So may it always be. Now, friends, I will lift before you my gratefulness. Normally we would have baskets up here and they'd be filled with your cards, but this is what Mike Pellin told me today, who works in our finance department, that there are fistfuls full of cards that are coming in already. That the online way of doing it, whether that's push pay or, or on the website, that there are folks who are giving that way. Some of you are calling and telling Mike how to fill out your cards. And what that does is allow us to continue to rejoice amidst difficult circumstances and, and literal storms to find the peace, the gentleness, and the hope. Let's pray. Almighty and gracious God, however these gifts are being given this year, 
whatever is in the hearts of people both who are members of this church and who are far beyond this church worshiping with us in so many different ways. We give you grateful thanks. And we know it takes, it takes all of us. And that you don't care about the amount of the gift. You care about the giver. And so bless us in our giving. Bless us because we receive more when we give. <laughs> and bless the work of our hands and our hearts from this community where you have created a home. In Jesus' name, amen.